In this unit, we're going to discuss infrared spectroscopy and mass spectrometry, two methods that give us information about the nature of functional groups and the mass of a sample and organic compound. And these are two methods directed toward elucidating the structure of an organic chemical sample. The other important one, which has a whole unit dedicated to it, is NMR spectroscopy. These are really sort of the ground truth analytical methods that tell us what we're dealing with in terms of the molecular structure of an organic compound. And they're really a critical piece of the empirical side of organic chemistry, how we know the product we're expecting is the product we got, how we know we've got a pure sample of a compound and all that kind of stuff. And here we're starting with a couple of methods that are fairly general. We don't get a lot of detailed information about what atoms are connected to what other atoms, what the precise molecular structure is, but we do get information about the functional groups in the sample and the mass of the sample, and in some cases, some structural information from mass spectrometry experiments regarding how the functional groups are connected. And so what we're going to do in this unit is first introduce the idea of spectroscopy and spectroscopy experiments in general, talk a little bit about the interaction between light and matter and why that matters and why that gives us great insight. And then we're going to dig into infrared spectroscopy, talking about the harmonic oscillator model, which is a theoretical basis for understanding infrared spectra and how vibrations of bonds depend on the masses of atoms involved in the bonds and the bond order. We'll learn how to interpret an infrared spectrum to infer functional groups present in the sample. We can't see how those functional groups are connected from an infrared spectrum, but we can elucidate the nature of the functional groups in many cases. Then we'll turn our attention to mass spectrometry, and we'll learn about the basics of the mass spectrometric experiment and the output, which is called a mass spectrum. We can interpret a mass spectrum to get quite a bit of useful information. The molecular weight or molecular mass of the sample is really the first thing we'll want to look for. But thanks to isotopes and natural isotopic abundance, which is going to be present in our sample, we can also get information about the types of atoms involved in the compound. For example, chlorine and bromine are two very common elements that we can spot on a mass spectrum by looking for very specific patterns in the shapes of peaks. In the mass spec experiment, fragmentation of the molecule commonly occurs. And from a, if we know the molecular structure, we can actually predict the structures of these fragments by thinking about relatively stable positions where cations could show up. And if we have a mass spectrum in hand, we can use the the quantitative nature of the mass spectrum and the spacing between peaks to deduce fragments that are lost or deduce the structure of a charged fragment that's showing up in the spectrum. All of this gives us structural information about the compound. Finally, at the end of this unit, we're going to calculate a highly useful value known as the hydrogen deficiency index. This is a number that tells us the number of rings or multiple bonds in the structure. And it's highly useful because it can point us toward particular functional groups. For instance, the benzene ring, which is three, three double bonds and one ring, right, has an HDI of four. So if our sample has an HDI of four and say a relatively small number of carbons, this provides pretty strong evidence that there's a benzene ring in the structure and we can look to other analytical methods, infrared, NMR, to really confirm that yes, there's a benzene ring in the structure. So the HDI is a highly useful value. Once you've got the molecular weight and a likely molecular formula from the mass spectrum, calculating HDI is often the next step to elucidating the structure of an organic compound. The basis of spectroscopy is the interaction of light with matter, and the fact that how light interacts with matter depends on the molecular structure of that matter. And so let's start by talking a little bit about the nature of light. Light is sort of a quantum phenomenon with wave-like and particle-like characteristics. From the classical wave-like perspective, light is an oscillating electromagnetic wave, with the electric and magnetic components oscillating at right angles to each other like you see in this graph. And from that classical picture, we can infer that the speed of light, a constant c, is equal to the wavelength of the light, which is typically represented as lambda, times the frequency of the light, which is typically represented as nu. And the units of wavelength are length units, meters, nanometers, and the units of frequency are inverse time. So something like inverse seconds, that's one hertz, or megahertz, gigahertz, kilohertz, etc. Now, light can also be thought of as a particle or set of particles 
called photons. And on the particle model, each photon of light carries with it an energy proportional to the frequency. And the constant of proportionality here is known as Planck's constant. So the way the units shake out here, because frequency has units of inverse time, Planck's constant has units of ener energy times time. And we can use this version with the frequency, or we can replace the frequency with c divided by the wavelength, actually applying this equation to determine that the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength here. And the units here also work out because this is a length per time, this is dividing by that length, and this is the energy times the time, giving us units of energy overall. And this is a highly useful way to think about spectroscopy. The idea of many spectroscopy experiment, experiments is varying this, varying this energy, varying the energy of photons striking the sample, and seeing whether and how the sample responds by absorbing the light or doing something else that we can detect. The energies of light span a massive range, and light in different, different wavelength and energy ranges excites molecules in different ways. For example, gamma rays and x-rays can break molecules apart entirely, causing even core electrons to fly out of core shells and atoms to just completely fall apart. Ultraviolet light tends to keep molecules together unless some kind of photochemical reaction occurs, but promotes electrons from lower energy to higher energy orbitals inside the molecule. Visible light is the same. On the other side of visible light, at the infrared, we tend to excite molecular vibrations. We get bonds vibrating and wagging and bending and stretching and all that kind of stuff. And then in the microwave and radio wave regions, we get rotations typically excited by microwaves, and in the radio wave region we actually get nuclear spin transitions, which are very, very low energy transitions that nonetheless give us very useful information about the structure of the molecule, as we'll see. So each of these ranges is associated with a particular type of spectroscopy. Um, destroying molecules outright is generally not useful, so you won't see X-rays and gamma rays used in spectroscopy that often, and not at all in this course. Um, but the ultraviolet gives us information about conjugated systems present in the molecule, which tend to absorb in the UV and visible ranges. Infrared tells us about the functional groups present in the compound, because different functional groups have bonds that vibrate in different ways. And nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which lives in this radio region of the spectrum, actually can give us insight into how atoms are connected in the molecular structure. The specific arrangement of carbons and hydrogens in the molecule, along with functional group information that tends to be redundant with the IR spectrum. So as you see, just from these three types of spectroscopy alone, we can get a lot of useful information about the nature of an organic compound. In a typical spectroscopy experiment, we start with the sample placed in the instrument, and that sample is bombarded with some input light. This may vary in wavelength and energy, so that we can see how the sample responds to the range of wavelengths applied. But a particular instrument is optimized for a particular wavelength range, ultraviolet visible, infrared, NMR, etc. How the sample responds to the input light depends on the molecular structure of the sample. So we capture and analyze the output light using a detector, and then we plot the frequency or wavelength or energy of the input applied light on the x-axis and the intensity of the sample's response in some way on the y-axis. And this may be the amount of light absorbed, the amount of light that the sample lets through, that's transmitted. This may be some other measure of the intensity of the response. And this plot we get when we plot the frequency or energy or wavelength on the x-axis and intensity of response on the y-axis is called a spectrum. And this is really the piece of data that gives us deep insight into molecular structure as long as we know how to look at it the right way, right? This is an NMR spectrum, this is an infrared spectrum, and this is an ultraviolet visible spectrum. And right now it just may look like a bunch of squiggles, but by the end of this unit, you'll be able to insightfully interpret infrared spectra like this to get information about functional groups. For example, we'll be able to take one quick glance at this and recognize immediately that there is a hydroxyl group in this compound, and that huge dip around 3,300 wave numbers is great evidence of that.